Um, so I just hit record. And just so you know, uh, if you're still on here watching, uh, you're aware now that this is being put up on YouTube and that you have the option to turn your video uh, off down below. So with that said, uh, yeah, let's dive in. Uh, this is kind of exciting. So we started the series back last fall. Uh, and really, it came out of the idea that, you know, uh, just a lot of people were really struggling and feeling the weight of the world and feeling in isolation with COVID. Uh, and I was thinking, well, what's some way that we could bring to people together, uh, you know, around connection with community, connection around uh, good people, uh, help us be connected to nature when we're maybe feeling a little bit isolated, uh, and then also just learn skills around, you know, self-reliance, connection, um, and things that help contribute to us being better people in a better world. So that was kind of the intention. And I've been blown away by uh, the feedback and by the turnout and the guests. Uh, we ended up running one, a session in the fall and then we ran it again in the winter. And then we ended up doing a third round this spring. Uh, so this is the last one in the spring series. So I guess I'd like to just start by saying thank you uh, to everyone that's made this a success and for people showing up and to all our guests so far. Uh, it's been, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, the plan is to take a break for the summer now. Um, I might run a few kind of one-off kind of web classes and trainings over the summer. But I think we're going to take a formal break from like the weekly nature calls. Um, and if you're interested, then um, reach out because I'm thinking about restarting it up again in the fall if there's enough interest. Um, so if that's something that's of interest to you, maybe reach out and, and let me know uh, just by email there. Uh, you can message me at chris at chrisoutdoors.ca if you don't know my email already. Although you probably got one for the link tonight. So I guess you do have it already. Um, so yeah, on a logistical note, that's all I really need to share here tonight. And um, I'm going to pass it over to our guest right now, Carolyn Crawley. Uh, I'll introduce her afterwards, but um, at, to start off, she's just going to kind of bring our minds and our hearts together in a good way and, and help us just really, really connect to our senses and the earth and um, a sense of gratitude. So I'll pass it over to you right now, Carolyn. Uh, and thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Chris. Ani, bonjour. Gwe, skano, tanse, wache. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope uh, this day has found you well and your loved ones as well. So I just wanted to take a moment just to kind of get settled where we're at before I share some words of gratitude. So I just invite you to get comfortable in your space. If you have your video on, feel free to turn it off at this time. If you prefer not to have anyone look at you, that's okay. And perhaps just take some slow, deep breaths in through your nose if you're able to. Slowly filling your belly with air and slowly exhaling. And just continue to slow down the rhythm of your own breath. Perhaps as you're inhaling slowly, maybe hold your breath just for a few seconds before exhaling. Now just take a moment to tune into your senses, being aware of where you are. If it feels comfortable, feel free to close your eyes or have a soft gaze. Just meaning just focusing just somewhere with your eyes halfway shut. And as you continue to slow down the rhythm of your breath, I invite you to think and feel of a place out on the lands or by the waters or with the beings, a place that has given you joy or has touched your heart. And just be there in that place. Perhaps 
invoking your memory or using your imagination to tune in to what you are seeing at that place. And perhaps tuning in to your sense of hearing and noticing what are the sounds of that place. And perhaps even exploring the sense of that place. What could be the sensations that you could be experiencing? Could it be the warmth of the sun or a cool breeze? And perhaps notice any thoughts or feelings that may be arising in you as you are there at this special place that has given you joy. And perhaps if it feels right for you, explore any feelings of gratitude that you may be holding for this place. And in a moment, I'm going to invite you to return back to where you are, wherever that may be. But before you do, finding a way, a gentle way, to Step away from that memory, that place, but know that it's always there and you can always travel to there in your heart and in your mind. So bringing your awareness back to your surroundings, to the sounds that are surrounding you in this moment. And just being aware of where you are and returning your sight to full gaze. And so I'd like to start with a few words of gratitude. Elders in my life have always emphasized the importance of practicing gratitude. 
that every day I lay down that sema, that sacred medicine, to give thanks for all of creation. Haudenosaunee elders in my life have always emphasized the importance of the words that come before all else, known in English as the Thanksgiving Address. And those words are spoken always before all gatherings to help bring the people's minds and hearts together as one and to create that opportunity to acknowledge and give thanks for all of creation. So people can meet, gather in a good way. But I also want to mention that not only is this practice amongst Indigenous nations all across Turtle Island and all around the earth, but it's a practice that has existed amongst all of our ancestors. For we are all Indigenous to some place or places. And that the practice of gratitude is universal. And even the science shows the many benefits of being, of practicing gratitude on a daily basis. And so the Haudenosaunee, when they speak of all of those beings, they speak and take their time. And it takes time to acknowledge all the beings. And so I just want to share a few words of gratitude in my own way. And I invite you to think or feel who or what you are thankful for. And so this morning, I was greeted by my animal companions. I don't live with people. I live with two four-leggeds, a dog and a cat. And I was greeted by them. And I'm greeted by them every morning with such joy and such love and enthusiasm. And as I woke this morning, I could hear the songs of the birds as if they're greeting the new day. And when I walked out on the lands with Milo and offered that Sema, just noticing all the beings, the shades of green, the colorful bounty of the flowers, the busyness of the robins and all the other beings doing their daily tasks. I'm thankful for the food that I put into my body as well as the water. I'm thankful for my loved ones, for good health. And I'm thankful to be here this evening with all of you and to reconnect with Chris, an old buddy from back in the day. <laughs> and also seeing some familiar names that are on this call from back in the day. It's really good, it's a good feeling. And so I wanna just take a moment to invite you all, if it feels right for you, to write in the chat box what or who you're feeling thankful for, and I'll read those out loud as they come through. For family, for Laura and the land, for flowers and friends, the sun, for the stars and moon, for friends, my walk in the ravine, thankful for freedom and peace, for help, for beautiful inspirations from my garden. I'm also thankful for the birds that I hear when I wake up and visit my feeder, my family, the water I live on for the knowledge passed down, for the cool ocean air on a hot day and rhubarb, 
thankful for my sister and singing with my choir. To be gifted with life at this transforming time. For rain and all water. Gratitude for good friends. I'm grateful for the memory of the swamp, for the mountains, for the spring season. I'm grateful for you and for Chris, this nature series, my children, family, friends, for the nature and life, love all around us. Thankful for the food on our table, so vibrant and colorful, for a whole lifetime of special places to choose from in this meditation the quiet day, for my mom texting to find out what I'd like for dinner when I visit. I'm thankful for the privilege to be on this wonderful giving earth, for chimney swifts who are my neighbors, that my garden is sprouting and for my backyard chickens, for the full flower moon last night, good people in my life, the colors outside, bird song, the hummingbirds outside. I'm thankful for all of creation, my family, and this chance to enjoy this season. The Nuthatch family has babies, and the dad is singing about it. I'm grateful for my family, for health, for children, for bees, and all other of Great Spirit's creations. My dog grew in connection to earth through gardening. I'm very grateful for these sessions. Thankful for peleated woodpeckers this morning, for water and grandmother moon. All of creation, especially my little grandchildren. To be able to have a roof over my head and a job through this difficult time. Grateful for life and grateful to our great Mama Earth, Miigwech, for today. Grateful for my horse and the love and trust she puts in me. For willow trees, for gratitude, for family. You read this like poetry. Oh, thank you. I'm grateful for my son and my son's father, for love. Thankful to Chris and to you. Thankful. And I don't know how to pronounce the name. I'm gonna ask you, Nicole, if you can unmute yourself and you could say, Nicole Van Stone. Not sure if she can unmute herself. I'm just seeing if I can do that really quick. Oh, oh here we go. Okay. I just did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nicole, if you can say, um, I don't want to mispronounce. Okay. It's um, it's Minobe Madzuin, which is Anishinaabe Muin for the good life. So I don't know if I spelled it correctly, but I'm just so thankful for that connection. Ooh, but, thank you, Nicole. And thankful for each person here sharing this space. For the forest, lake, and sunshine to be with you all this evening. Mm. Thank you, everyone. Miigwech walalio for all those words of gratitude to help bring our hearts and minds together. All right, I'm passing it over to you, Chris. Awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, I really needed that tonight. Um, I, I was telling Carolyn and Sherry Ann and I were on before the call and I was telling her I had a bit of a heavy hearted day today and um, yeah the poetry of your voice there Carolyn and, and just kind of reminding us of what's really important in life is uh, that's that's good medicine for me today so I, I'm so thankful for that and uh, thankful for you and um, we had the little joke there you know we're like man how long were we Carolyn and I spent a bunch of time together uh, immersed in kind of nature connection and learning skills uh, I think we maybe met at like a pottery course or something like that like a uh, survival kind of pottery class and then um, Carolyn took a couple of classes that I ran and uh, our paths seemed to intersect for a couple of years and, and we had a few really potent experiences kind of out in the woods and um, yeah just involved in some real kind of powerful connection experiences and then um, 
for whatever reason, kind of drifted drifted in different ways for a number of years and, and just weren't in touch. And then um, I saw her on one of these calls kind of at the beginning of the series. And it was just like, you know, this was coming back in the winter. And I was just like, oh my goodness, Carolyn, out of nowhere, you're here. This is so cool. And so I reached out to her afterwards and we caught up. And then I said, man, I would love it if you came on as a guest because uh, the work you've been up to since we, oh, well, probably long before, but um, you've been up to such fascinating work and, and very important work too. Uh, if I just kind of think about where humanity's at and where the world's at right now. So um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my introduction to Carolyn. And then we were like, well, you know, it feels like so long ago. I, got, I think it was maybe only 10 years. So it's like, is that back in the day? And then we decided, yeah, back in the day, we can call it back in the day. We're friends from back in the day. So uh, that's where we landed tonight. Um, I guess maybe to start us off, is there anything you kind of want to share about your, your story and your background before I kind of, I, I do have a question in mind, but I'm not sure if you want to share anything just to introduce yourself first, more formally, Carolyn. Or would you like me just to go into the first question? Sure, I, I can share a little bit about my story. But before I do, I just want to say one more word of gratitude that came through. Grateful for the sound of little feet running, my grandchildren and other children. So I just wanted to share that one. Um, yeah, so I can share a little bit about me because, you know, um, the power of story can really help connect us to each other. And so uh, I wanna share just a little bit about myself and uh, those who have shared with me because that's really important. And when we're thinking about the power of story, all of our ancestors at one time and place sat around a fire sharing stories um, to learn and connect with one another. And we can see that practice still happening today. Sometimes it's around a campfire or maybe it's around a kitchen table. So, with myself, I was born in the East Coast, known today as Nova Scotia. I'm, I'm Mi'kmaq. I also have Black and Irish ancestry. Uh, I didn't grow up with my, um, my culture, right? You know, due to um, colonization. And uh, so it wasn't until I was an adult that I started to go to ceremony. And you know, when I think about myself as a young child, you know, especially someone who has multiple ancestry lineages in me, you know, I, I left Nova Scotia when I was really young and came to Takaronto and, uh, you know, just really finding my way, uh, where do I fit in, you know, and that was a bit of a journey for me. And, uh, you know, like when I think of my ancestors, I have very strong blood lines moving through me and uh, you know when I think about that um, there, my relationship with mother earth really helped to guide me to who I am today and uh, that's really important to me uh, my spirit name is Bimose Mashkiki in Dichnikas or Bimose Mashkiki and uh, which translates to uh, walks with the medicines and I take that spirit name very seriously um, because, you know, it's not just the medicines of the plants, but it's also my words can be medicine. My actions can be medicine. And so it comes with a, a big responsibility. So I believe I am spirit living a human experience at this time. And I carry the resilience of my ancestors who have experienced so much oppression and continue to do so. But yet there's so much wisdom in each of, the, of their cultures. And so, you know, it's been a journey for me to be here. But I'm very thankful for every step. And so um, my, mom, my mom grew up on country foods. And, uh, you know, so my grandfather, he hunted, he fished. Um, they also farmed. And uh, my grandmother, she knew of the medicines of the land. She was a uh, very powerful, uh, she had very powerful knowledge, right? That knowledge that was passed down of knowing the medicines. And, you know, my grandfather, when diphtheria was running through the community, became very ill and was at kind of that death's door. And my grandmother 
uh, knew the medicines and harvest them and she had him sweated out and she saved his life as well as um, my uncles and my auntie's lives as well at different times because there was no doctor, right? No hospital in the area. So it was important to know those medicines. And, you know, from a very young age, my mother always nurtured um, in me that relationship um, with Mother Earth. You know, I learned from a very young age to appreciate Mother Earth and all that, all those gifts, right? to be respectful. And like I was saying, you know, it wasn't until my older years that I started going to ceremony. But I also want to mention, too, that um, it's really important for me to mention the people in my life who inspired me. I've had the great honor and pleasure to have several elders in my life. And it's really important that I acknowledge them as well. And so I've had the pleasure of being in ceremony with um, you know, with Mark and Wendy Phillips, um, with Diane Longboat, um, and Mark and Wendy Phillips are Anishinaabe, um, Diane Longboat is Mohawk, Haudenosaunee, um, Maladoma Somme, he's from, he's a medicine man from Burkina Faso, um, who I've been in ceremony with, Ma uh, Mandaza, who's from Zimbabwe, who's also a medicine man, but I've been in ceremony with over the years and many other knowledge carriers and, and so many other people. And then also just the, the, the people that I've met through art of mentoring and headwaters gatherings and, you know, like, you know, Chris and all the other people, people on this call that I've, I've seen, that I've connected with and I've learned from um, so many, 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 many things that I'm so thankful for. I remember Chris teaching me about bird language. And I remember playing this game with Chris and he had these chairs set up and they were like, you had to, if you were like, he would say a bird or, or play the bird song. And then you had to run to like, which habitat that was displayed on the chair or something like this, or, and move in that way that the bird moved. Or, and, you know, I tell you, because before then, I was trying to learn bird language. Like I knew the plants, like the food, the medicines and the mushrooms, but I, it was so hard to wrap my mind around the bird language. And playing that game with Chris actually helped me. And from then I learned with Dan Gardoki and took like the bird intensive and then um, learned with John Young and so many others, you know, around bird language. So I'm really thankful. That was a really uh, sweet memory that I had because, you know, uh, and so, you know, what's brought me here kind of, you know, over the years, I worked in mental health for over 20 something years as a child and youth worker and, you know, really seeing that disconnection that's in that system and that I won't really get into, but, um, but also studying holistic nutrition to see that connection with our food and our moods and so forth but then also getting people connected to the land. And so I've worked in food security now for a number of years and operate my own business called Miss Anokoma. And I'm also a forest therapy guide. And I was a trainer and mentor for five years um, with an association that was training people to become forest therapy guides. So with my work, I'm really just passionate about connecting people with the land to support them to find their way back home to that relationship because all of our ancestors at one time and place were in a deeper, more meaningful relationship that was culturally unique and specific to where we were located. So that's kind of a little bit about uh, me in a little tiny nutshell. So yeah. Uh, that bird story, I totally forgot about that game. <laughs> I could picture it when you were, uh, when you were explaining <laughs> it, so fun. That's great. I'm glad that one that one sunk in for you. <laughs> it did. It did. It so did. Yeah. So we we titled tonight's call um, not entitled, and I'll maybe make a comment about that later for those of you that saw my email. And hopefully, some of you laughed that I did. That that was actually a big, yeah, a, a lot came up for me in that actually, and, and maybe maybe it'll come up later, maybe it won't. But there there was some some deep irony in that for me, and you may or may not have felt it as well. But. Um, I guess where I'd like to, to go, you know, the, the theme of the night um, that I kind of put out when, when we called it was all my relations or uh, msinokama, I, I believe if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, this concept of all my relations. Um, 
And I guess, I guess what I'd like to maybe ask here is, it's, it's interesting because I have a little bit of a, a relationship with that, that idea just from teachings that I've been really privileged to be a part of um, over the years. And, and I've been finding particularly deep, um, a particularly deep drawing to really come back to that in these times. It just seems so confusing to me these days, you know, um, there, there's a lot to process in the world right now. Um, there's a lot of decisions to be made and there's a lot of conflict and, um, and I keep kind of just coming back to that, that concept of all my relations being something that just has so much medicine and value. So uh, it's something that I'm very much wanting to explore deeper in my own life right now. So I'm not exactly sure how you'd like to speak to it, but maybe, maybe a good way to, to ask would just be Snokama. Like, what, what does that mean to you, Carolyn? And, and, um, and why is that such a big part of your journey? And um, what would you like to share with us tonight about it? Yeah. Um... When I think about Mr. Nokama, like it, it's all our relations, right? That's what it translates in English. And this is a, a term, a, a phrase that's very common amongst all indigenous nations from coast to coast to coast. And really it's seeing the interconnectedness, knowing the interconnectedness of all beings, that we're all related. And that every being has a purpose that all life is sacred and that all life should be respected. And so when I think of all my relations, you know, um, for me, and you'll hear this from many other um, peoples as well, is that I see mother earth as my family. You know, she is my first teacher She's my healer because I harvest medicines. Uh, she's my companion. And for the times that I feel sorrow or I feel alone, you know, I go out in the land and share and release those tears when needed. And so it's about, for me, is seeing her as my family, that I'm to treat her with as much love and respect as I do my human family. And it's important for people to understand or to know that, you know, this earth, Mother Earth has existed for billions of years without us. And she was able to thrive without us. But we are not able to thrive without her. We are needing Mother Earth and her health is so dependent upon our health and vice versa, because what we do impacts her and what happens to her impacts us. Right? There's that direct connection there. And when I think about all my relations, it's, um, there's a responsibility. I have a responsibility of how do I carry myself day to day. I have a responsibility for my words and for my actions, for my thoughts because thoughts are also very powerful. And when I'm thinking about all my relations, you know, this is, um, I guess, well, I won't get into that because that's probably what we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but when, when I think about all my relations, I think about that importance of, thinking of all beings, not just now, but the generations to come. So it's not just about us who are here today, but it's about those seven generations that are yet to be born. And all my actions, I need to take into that consideration. So yeah, I think that's kind of a little bit about what all my relations means to me. I mean, it goes so much deeper than that but that's just kind of you know just skimming on the surface I guess you can say yeah I feel like you know the more I'm exposed to it I, I feel like there's these layers with with everything in life and I guess nature kind of works like that too you know um, there's just these layers of relationship that just unfold themselves over time so that, that's really beautifully said um 
It's interesting. I, I might just come back to that email for a second because uh, and just share a little bit about a, a little thing that kind of popped in my mind and it might be a good segue into uh, where, where I kind of wanted to go next. But I, I thought it was so ironic that I used the word entitled next to all my relations. And I meant to say the title of tonight's call is all my relations. And, and I think in retrospect, I'd rather not even use the word title. I would have liked to said just the theme or the, the conversation tonight will be around this, this, this idea or concept or, or for lack of better words there. Um, and it was kind of funny. It actually took me down this interesting mental thought rabbit hole. And I'm using this as a little bit of a segue into what the other topic that Carolyn and I had chatted about discussing. Uh, but I had a, this moment of, for a, a split second, feeling like, well, all my relations, like, I feel like everybody is entitled to that, you know? Like, every human should be, like, entitled to, like, this deep sense of relationship and that there's health in that. But then I, simultaneously, I had this, like, instant moment of being, like, entitled, though. What does that word actually mean? Because entitlement actually seems like a very kind of Western word or even a colonial word. And when I started thinking about that, it almost comes across as, like, entitlement is almost like dominion over or, uh, like, a deed of the land. Like, I'm entitled to this land. And that actually very much goes against all my relations. Uh, and then the next word that I actually came to was like, okay, well, I think it's almost like a right. And then I thought about that. And I'm like, well, kind of, but kind of, the word right doesn't even feel right. And the word I actually got to after that was actually responsibility. And it was interesting. You just said like this comment about like, uh, if we're in all my relations, it actually comes with responsibility. So maybe right is not the right word that we all have a right to all my relations, but just this idea that, you know, we have a responsibility maybe to all my relations. And this is me just kind of free flowing because I'm in a little bit of a journey with this as myself as well there. But it actually just got me thinking a lot about, you know, how important that concept is and how words might actually pull us away from it without us even knowing it. Uh, and I've been really thinking a lot about how powerful words are right now. And, you know, I see so much conflict between people, even people that care about each other or kind of want the same, you know, big picture vision for humanity. Um, and I see words just throw that off all the time, you know, when they're fighting, they maybe both want the same thing, but they're fighting over a different interpretation of a word. So I've been thinking a lot about the power of words lately. So it just hit me so strong. Like I was literally laughing out loud when I'm like, oh my goodness, did I just write entitled and all my relationships <laughs> side by side? I'm like, there's no way that felt like, like trickster energy there or something that like typed through me and wanted to teach me something. And uh, maybe there's some teachings for other people <laughs> as well uh, related to those. So, so that was a lot I just said there, Carolyn, but I don't, would you like to speak a little bit, uh, whether about the power of words or, or even that word entitlement, or where, where do you want to go with, yeah. with what I just shared there? Yeah, well, you know, words, language can be weaponized, right? Um, you know, especially when they're words of hate, and that creates that division. And then there's power in words, right? You know, there's almost like a hierarchy in words when you think of just even in this Western cultural context, um, you know, there's language that not everybody understands. You know, the jargon that lawyers speak or the, the, the words that, you know, the medical profession speak, you know, there's just all these, this language that kind of creates division amongst us when we think of the English language. And then when I think of Anishinaabe Moan, um, you know, it's very animated in a sense. It tells a story of the beings. So I remember um, a buddy of mine, uh, Joseph, he was telling me about uh, lily pads. And I can't remember, there's not a moon name for lily pads, but what the translation means is the hunt is coming to you. And what that means is that uh, when moose are before they're mating, they come to chew on those roots of the lily pads to strengthen their muscles, right? So they're ready for that mating, right? And so people have known that, you know, if you are by the lily pads and you're a hunter and you're gonna take a bull, you know, to harvest, that uh, the hunt is literally coming to you in that way. So it's interesting when you think about language, whether it's um, whatever language it is, but I wanna also speak about colonial language, right? Cause you said that, you know, and when I think about colonial language, um, it really separates us from a relationship. So words can bring us together and connect us when they're words coming from our heart. Um, but then there's words that can really create a separation. And so thinking about the word resources. Now, just everybody just think about that word for a minute, resources. You know, this is a common word that's used all the time to, um, reference the waters, 
or the trees that have become lumber. And when we think of that word resources, does that make us feel connected to those particular beings? Or does it create a separation from all of that? And then also thinking of the words weeds to reference the plants that aren't intentionally planted there. Maybe they're referencing non-native species. But just kind of thinking about that word, weeds. Almost like a plant that's not wanted. And as I was mentioning, all life is sacred and all life has a purpose. And even though we may not want these particular plants here because they're overly competitive and having a huge impact on the lands, especially with native species, how do we, in a good way, remove those particular beings from the land? How do we remove those particular beings in a good way with, just as we would remove or harvest kale from the garden? Because a lot of times when I see people pulling out plants that are labeled as breeds, it's with kind of like this ferocity, you know, it's just like, you know, I'm going to get you kind of thing, right? It's a different kind of energy. Imagine what it would be like to approach those particular plants, letting them know that they can't be there for this time because we have to support the other plants. And so how do we remove them in that gentle way? How do we change the language instead of calling those plants weeds, but just calling the plants, you know, overly competitive? So there's a lot of words when we think about, um, you know, the weather, for example. Uh, if you, I know you, you can turn on, you can look on an app now for the weather forecast, but think about back in the day, you know, when people had to listen to the, the news forecaster on the radio or on the TV, some people may still do. Um, just pay attention next time how they reference rainy weather or snowy weather. How do, how do you think they reference it, Chris? I feel like it gets more dramatic every single year. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, cold morning, everybody run for the hills, get yourself inside, don't go near it, hide from nature. It's gonna be cold outside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's gonna be miserable, you know? You always hear that word miserable. And, uh, you know, for me, when I think about the rains, yeah, I'm sure it might give you a bad hair day, you know? Uh, might need to change your plans. The water is life. No being can exist without water. You know, at some point, we all need the water. And even though there's places around the world, people are praying for water because there's drought or maybe there's too much water, you know, whatever it might be. But uh, it's interesting, you know, because we're in a place where there's four seasons and people still seem to complain about the snowy weather, you know? Uh, yeah, someone said it's always an event. Yeah, another uh, negative body language, yeah. And so thinking about even just behaviors as well, um, colonial behaviors, there's like a lot of words in regards to language, Chris, but like when I think about colonial behaviors, the one thing I think about that comes straight to my mind is mowing the grass. I don't know if people ever thought about this, about mowing the grass. This, I, I'm curious, this, I'm wondering if anybody knows where mowing the grass comes from. Put it in the chat if you do. I'm just curious to see if people know, because a lot of people don't know what the history is of the mowed lawn. And I think I know uh, a little bit about it. First of all, yeah, what do you know? Uh, I, I mean, I, my understanding, I mean, in some ways, it's this sign of like Victorian era, like prestige. And it's like, I, I have enough wealth that I can afford to just actually have this big area that's kind of maintained and it's open and it's green and, and there's nothing there. It, it's kind of like entitled or deed or dominion over and, and a show of my wealth and my abundance and my status to be able to afford to just kind of waste a whole bunch of land uh, and, and have it be green. So maybe I'm a, a bit off, but I think there's some link to that maybe. 
Yeah, definitely. And I'm seeing in the chat too, a lot of people are saying some things definitely connected. We're, what it is, and I see someone um, kind of mentioned it. So, you know, it's coming from England and France. When people had grazing animals, you had to be wealthy, first of all, to have grazing animals. If you had grazing animals, then your grasses were mowed from the, the animals. And that became a symbol of wealth. Right, because people knew you had money if you had mowed grass because you had animals and you could afford the animals. And so this thing, this has kind of been transferred over to here and there's a whole history around that, um, how it came to be here. But when I think about this behavior of mowing grass, first of all, it's not even native grasses that are on people's lawns. Most of the grasses are coming from Europe or from South Africa. And also mowing the grass, think about what the impact is on the habitats of those little beings that live in the grasses. You know, think about those hot summer days when you're just like, oh, I just, you know, I need some shade, you know, kind of thing. Now imagine a little insect, you know, is living on some mowed grass and it's like, dang, like wh where do I go for shade? You know, we got to run across some hot concrete, you know, to get to like somewhere. You know, so just kind of thinking about that, it reduces the biodiversity because it reduces the habitat of all of those insects. Okay. So, um, so yeah, and Toronto has this weird bylaw that you can't even have grasses over a certain height, but now they're starting to change that. I was part of a biodiversity uh, committee. And so that's starting to change. Um, but yeah, definitely, yeah, lots of people mentioning about the, gra the grasses and, and, and all of that, yeah, and the history of it. And yeah, and to think too, even just in the history when the Europeans came, um, you know, they brought a lot of like the, sh the sheep and the cows and the and goats and other animals, and they actually unleashed them here to wipe out uh, the crops that the nations were either growing or, and also the native grasses that were here as well. So that's the other piece of history that's connected to that. Um, so yeah, so I, I wanted to maybe take a moment to do some breakout rooms and maybe just have a moment to just have a conversation with people to maybe generate a list or have, a, or, you know, just talk about some words, some colonial language or behaviors that maybe you've partake partook in or that you have witnessed or that's part of our system and uh, yeah and and just kind of have a conversation around that and how we can shift that what are the what are the words that we can use instead what can we do differently so yeah so if you could put people out in breakout rooms and just kind of have that conversation awesome yeah so I'm going to um, start these in just a half all right Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you all had some very uh, good conversations around uh, language and behavior. And feel free in the chat if you want to just, if there was anything that's kind of sticking to you right now, something like a key learning from that conversation, whatever it might be, just put it in the chat box for a moment. Just so other people can see. I won't read those out loud but just so that people have an opportunity um, to see what uh, resonated with people or what's a key takeaway from that conversation. Oh yeah, I, I'd seen the word poison ivy come up. You know, I, I actually like to talk about that particular plant being, um, I like to call that plant protector ivy, not poison ivy. And uh, because you know what an elder shared with me was like, you know, that particular plant comes up where areas are disturbed. And usually who's disturbing the areas? People, because that particular plant doesn't really affect the animals, but it definitely affect people. And uh, what the elder shared with me was that, uh, you know, that particular plant comes up and it's mother earth's 
kind of natural defense mechanism or kind of her own fencing in order to kind of keep those who are disturbing the area out so that she can heal and rejuvenate that particular area. So I, I see that plant as a protector. So I always like to share that story. Uh, so yeah, um, just thank you for sharing all of those words, uh, you know, that have coming up with all the conversations that you had. You know, I wanted to just share a little bit because I know we're getting already close to the time, and I was almost kind of wondering, Chris, oh, am I going to have enough to talk about? But uh, I think I need more time. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to uh, share a little bit because you know. When we're thinking about colonial language it's re and behaviors, it's really looking at Mother Earth as a commodity, right? Something to take from, to extract. Um, and there's little to no reciprocity, right? There's a huge relationship that's missing there. And, you know, what I've been taught by elders in my life is that importance of having healthy and reciprocal relationships, not only with Mother Earth, but with ourselves and with each other. And uh, that relationships are the foundation of everything. Oh, if you heard that sound, I don't know if you did, but that's my cat breaking through the barrier that I placed so that I know when she comes in here, she's gonna start meowing for food. So you might hear her. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so, you know, I wanted to just share a little bit because, you know, earlier I was talking a little bit about my story, Chris, and, and I was saying to Chris as, you know, we're putting people out in the break rooms. There's a couple of stories I wanted to share with people um, that really kind of convey um, all that Mother Earth provides to us and the messages. Because, you know, she's always communicating with us, always. You know, whether it's through the sounds of the bird language, the tracks of the land, through the direction of the winds, um, all the beings, right, of communicating or communicating with us. And, you know, I've had the the, the good pleasure of being in relation, not relationship, um, attending a training called Interspecies Communication many years ago. Um, if people don't know it, um, there's a really good documentary on YouTube called The Animal Communicator. I always uh, recommend that. But uh, I wanted to share a bit about of a story because with the power of story, sometimes there could be a message in that story. Oh, there she goes. Um, there could be a message in that story um, for those who are listening, that are witnessing the story. So, yes, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, when I was leading a training um, a couple of years ago, I was leading a forest therapy training. And um, on the last day I had sent out um, the guides on a walk, on a solo walk for them to just let their bodies um, be guided, just to follow their bodies where they, where they felt they needed to go. And they were out on the land for several hours. <clears throat> and, you know, some of them held an intention. Oh, it's like, it's a domino effect. <laughs> some of them uh, held an intention when they went out there. Others just had no agenda. And uh, when they were out there, like when, well, when they came back, we had a talking circle. And, uh, you know, I had this special stone. This is actually a stone that I found at, uh, when I was up in Findhorn. So this stone has been in lots of talking circles. And I held a talking circle and people have an opportunity to share if they want uh, about their experience out on the land. And, you know, people were sharing and, and the, the talking, the stone was going along. And then there was one woman who chose not to share and she passed the stone. And you know, people continued to share. And there was this one woman, Anna, who was sitting directly across from this woman. And she was so enthusiastic about her share. And she said, you know, when she was out on the land, she saw this tree and she just spent so much time with this tree. And she was so curious about who this tree was. And she was just like falling in love with this tree. And at one point she was so curious and she was like, oh, she was wondering what, what's the name of this tree? You know, who is this tree? So as she was kind of walking around the tree and kind of feeling the tree, she noticed down at the bottom that uh, someone had carved the name Mana in the tree, just real small. And 
she thought, oh, wow, her name is Anna and it rhymes. And well, she felt this deeper connection. And so she finished her story and you know the talking piece went around, people were sharing. And then I passed it around a second time in case there was anyone who didn't share that wanted to share. And the woman who passed took the song and she said, I feel like I need to share after hearing Anna's story. And she said that when she went out on the land, she had the intention of wanting to communicate with her mother, to connect with her mother who had passed just months before. And she was holding a lot of grief still. And she was out in the land and she was looking and searching and searching and searching for just any sign, any communication from her mother. And, you know, when it was time to come back and she sat in the circle at this talking circle, you know, she said her heart was heavy and she was sad. She said she got a lot of other things out of the experience, but she was really wanting that message from her mother. And then she said that when she heard Anna's story, she knew her mother was with her because her mother's name was Mana. So imagine that Mana is not a common name. And when she shared that, it was just kind of like, <gasps> You heard the gasp, you know? And I could feel the hair standing on my skin, you know? And how beautiful it was to witness that, that gift of sharing the story. Because when we're thinking about all my relations, we're all interconnected, all of us. We're not separated from nature, you know? And the power of story helps to connect us with each other. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that. And, you know, I've had the, the great honor, Chris, to, um, to witness a lot of people. And I'm sure you have too over the years, you know, and had your own experiences. And I'm sure lots of people on this call as well. And, uh, you know, there was this one time, and, and I'll share this, where this one man I was leading forest therapy walk in. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Chris, but you know, after we had the walk, or when we have the walk and I get guided invitation, people come back and they have an opportunity to share if they feel so to do so. And this one man who worked from the corporate world, he, um, he started to share, but then he started to kind of like freeze up and you could tell there was some emotion there. And, you know, it looked like he felt embarrassed because unfortunately there's a lot of stigma around grief and expressing grief, right? You know, and, and especially, um, you know, uh, you know, for people in, in certain positions, maybe, um, or certain identities, you know, there's these expectations that you don't express your grief in that way. And he got choked up and he said that um, he couldn't remember the last time he touched a tree. Can you believe that? He couldn't remember the last time he touched a tree and that brought him to grief. And so when I think about even all my relations, you know, when we're talking about that responsibility to be walking in that good way, Chris, you know, um, it's also, there's a responsibility for us to be able to move through our grief in a good way, you know, to be able to release it. Because if we hold on to our grief, then it impacts not only us, but it impact, impacts all those that, are, that we are connected to as well in that way. And so, you know, grief is important, but how do we move through it? So I just wanted to share those stories, Chris. I can go on and on. Mm. Now that's so, so powerful, you know, and, um, you know, just, just a real quick story. It kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, going to my mom one time because, uh, you know, I've been, you know, kind of teaching, you know, wilderness survival skills for, you know, 15, 20 years now, really. Um, but really, it's not about survival, you know, it's about this deep connection and, you know, that moment where the person from the corporate world that wants to do a weekend getaway of survival has that moment where they're like, oh my goodness, I don't know the last time I touched a tree. And I remember coming home to my mom one day and telling her that, hey, yeah, I had, I, it was a workshop on fire making. Like we were teaching people how to make fires. And I was telling her how like during the closing circle, almost the whole circle was in tears. And she was like, what did you do? You were teaching them to make fire. <laughs> it was just like, oh, but that's just, that's the depth of like, you know, that connection. And especially in this modern world where it's, it's so lost for so many people. And, you know, it's one thing to know the, the idea, all my relations, um, theoretically or as a concept. And then it's a whole different thing to just to start to feel the layers of it just be revealed throughout a lifetime, you know? So uh, it really just speaks to the power there. Maybe maybe a nice segue with that mm -hmm. and, and knowing that we're coming near the end would be around like, 
what, what about some kind of activities or tools that the, the team or the, the, the people with us here this evening could take to work on, whether it's their own connection or uh, Colonial Lane, wherever you want to go? What, what would be some takeaways that folks could leave tonight with or practices? Yeah, I, I think definitely spending as much time outside as possible. Um, there was this one study that it came across across um, from the environment, I think it was the Environmental Protection Agency that did this study. Um, I, can't, I can't remember how many people were involved in this study, but it was based in the US. And it showed that 93% of Americans' time is spent indoors. Think of that, 93% of your time spent inside. That's just mind boggling. You know, and of course, like when we're thinking about a global pandemic and, um, you know, the seasons or whether someone's living in a rural or urban area, you know, those numbers are going to differ, right? But the one thing I always say, Chris, like get outside, connect with Mother Earth, find a way um, to build that relationship. You know, you know, I was talking a lot from Indigenous perspectives, um, but, you know, with Western science, which is slowly trying to catch up to Indigenous knowledges, uh, you know, there's over like a thousand studies of showing the many benefits of being in nature. And that even as little as two hours a week can be beneficial. So I think the one thing for people that I always suggest is making sure that we're being guided by this, by our hearts, more so than this. You know, we could see in today's society, um, you know, those who, you know, the systems, they're powered by this, you know, and not enough by this. And we need to be able to be guided by this and bring these two together as one, right? Because the mind can also benefit us in many ways, but it also can cause a lot of hindrance as well. And, you know, just finding a way to um, deepen our relationships with ourselves, with each other, with the lands and all the beings and the waters. And the one thing too, I always talk about is like, if you're gonna be outside, like if you go to the woods, you know, park or whatever, and sometimes people like wanna go up for a hike, right? And they're moving quickly. The one thing I always suggest is take the time and just notice where you are, slow down, move slower than you're used to, and just tune into the senses, right? Just take that moment, just notice, what are the, the orchestra of sounds, you know? What, what, what's the sensations that I'm feeling right now? What are the scents in the air? To really just take that time to notice and to be present is really, really key. And then, you know, as always, like, you know, the sit spot and probably a lot of people here know about sit spot, is finding that place close to you, going out there, you know, as often as possible and just being there at that spot. It could be a backyard, a balcony, it could be a local park, a parkette. You don't need to go far, just find a place out on the land near the waters or by the beans and just be with no agenda. And you know, if you go to that place in different times of day, different kinds of weather, um, if it's safe to do so, of course, um, you know, you start to get familiar with the beings there. And the beings start to get familiar with you, as you know, because I know you guys this spot, Chris, right? You know, we all like from art of mentoring and, and, and all that, we all talk about sit spots and everything, but that's an ancient practice, right? And indigenous sciences um, were based upon observation, right? Being in relationship with all the beings and noticing. And so it's about that. It's just about slowing down and connecting in that way. Um, the other thing too, I always wanted to mention is, um, you know, really when we're thinking about, um, there's a lot of talk about reconciliation and there's a lot of different opinions about that. And, uh, you know, the one thing I always emphasize that, um, that people need to also reconcile with the land and the waters and the beings because they've also been greatly harmed by colonization. And, you know, it's important to know where we are as well as part of that relationship. Because as I mentioned from indigenous teachings that have been shared with me, there's no separation between the people and the beings and the lands and the waters. And so when I've done uh, other work and I talk with people about, um, about 
deconstructing colonial ways and so forth. You know, a lot of times when I ask people, and this is obviously before COVID when people could travel freely, you know, asking people how many people like travel to a country where, you know, they speak a different language. And how many times do people learn a phrase or a greeting, right, in the language? or learn a little bit about the culture or experience the foods or, you know, know about the history of the politics of the place. You know, that's pretty common when people have that privilege to go travel, to explore that. But then when I ask them what they know about this place known today as Canada, they can't say the same. And so people spend more time learning about other countries, but don't really know about this place and the history of these lands. And so, or even know about the dish with one spoon wampum, you know, the treaty agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. You know, so part of that as what we could do is taking that time, you know, seek out indigenous sources in regards to history. You know, that's really important because history has been rewritten by many people and really take that time, you know, to learn from, you know, indigenous authors, this beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass, I don't know if that's come up during any of your calls, beautiful book um, by Robin Wild Kimmer, and she's also on YouTube too, um, with a lot of the things she speaks. There's a really beautiful elder named Albert, Elder Albert Marshall, he's Mi'kmaq, and he talks about two-eyed seeing, so bringing indigenous knowledges and Western science together in that sense, right? Um, and how we can see and walk in those two worlds together. Um, you know, other books that I highly recommend is The Healing Wisdom of Africa, written by Maladoma Somme, who I've had the pleasure of being in grief ceremonies with. Um, you know, for times when we may feel overwhelmed, Chris, because you know, there's those days, right? When you, we're watching the news and there's just so much going on. And, you know, sometimes I start to lose faith in humanity. You know, sometimes I have those moments and there's a whole series on YouTube. Yeah, I, you know, there's a whole series on YouTube called Faith in Humanity. And uh, it's just video clips of people helping other people or people helping animals or animals helping other animals. And it's just people who have been caught on video sometimes not even knowing. And it's, uh, it's sometimes I just watch that for like 10 minutes just to kind of lift my spirits to think, yeah, there are people out there that care because we're only hearing the stories of people on the news that aren't very good stories. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of like, you know, some of the things that I would talk about, um, you know, you know, learning about uh, what's going on when people, when you hear about indigenous nations standing up and defending the land, or protecting the waters, you know, finding ways to imp like, you know, to share that message, you know, with your friends and family, have conversations about what's going on. So yeah, I think, uh, oh yeah, what was the YouTube channel? It's called, it was Faith in Humanity. Yeah, oh, Chris wrote it down, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, so I think that's, uh, I mean, I, there's so many more things that I can say, but really just be conscious, be responsible, hold yourself accountable, right? We have a responsibility to walk in a good way, you know? Be mindful of your words. I know sometimes I may speak slower because I'm actually being conscious of the words that I speak. Because once I put them out there, they're out there. Yeah. Wow, there was there was so much in there, Carolyn. Uh, I think it was Sherry Ann said I could just sit here and listen to Caroline talk all night, and uh, I could I could easily do the same thing. Um, uh, yeah. So I guess I guess the question would be, you know, if people want to sit and hear you talk all night, <laughs> where where can people hear you talk more, um, or or what what do you have going on? Anything oh, that people know about, whether it's your own work or, or projects you're involved in, or or things you'd like to plug right now? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, definitely check out my website. Um, join the email list. I only send out um, events. Like, I don't bombard people with anything else. So I'll just be sharing um, upcoming events. So uh, those who are on my email list, I actually send out 
uh, this event. Uh, so any free events I let people know of as well that I might be doing because a lot of times people like park people or high park center or whoever it might be hire me to do certain things and then they're free for the public. So I always like to share um, not only things that I'm doing um, that I charge, but also free events. And yeah, I think that's the kind of the best way to stay in touch with me. I've got a lot of things going on. On. I'm going to be organizing or setting some dates of some programs that I'll be doing in High Park around the, the foods and the medicines of the plant, of the beans, uh, doing forest therapy walks and kind of doing this kind of uh, session on my relations, but out on the land. And then it will include forest therapy, it'll include some teachings and, and all of that, right? Storytelling and more. So, yeah. Uh, Sherry Ann, it looks like um, oh, a couple of people maybe just shared uh, Carolyn's website there. Um, it looks like maybe Arianne there put it up there, and Sherry Ann's going to maybe throw it at the bottom again there in a, in a moment there. Um, yeah. I, I got one really short story that I think would be really nice just to, and you were talking about reframing kind of relationships and, and this decolonizing language. And we had this beautiful experience at the Pine Project years ago uh, where we were needing to teach kids about the poison ivy out on the land. Um, and, and we're just hitting this point of being like, wow, that's. That's a bad story to just be teaching them that poison ivy is the stuff that hurts them and makes them itchy. And we were just trying to think about like, how do we rebuild the relationship that kids have with poison ivy? Um, and the idea that like, hey, where's the poison ivy growing? Oh, well, it's in places that humans have actually disturbed uh, that, have, that have created the, the conditions that it grows in. Um, and I can't remember what it was. I think it was one of the actual campers themselves came up with this beautiful song. Uh, and I'm not gonna sing it, but I'll, I'll go over the words because there's only a few of them. It was really beautiful. If you can imagine this little like eight year old girl singing this song on the land and it was leaves of three let them be don't you go so fast uh or no leaves of three let them be. oh no i just lost the second word i had it a moment ago it was so good leaves of three let them be oh don't you get too close poison ivy you protect the forest the most and then it was you can be itchy and you can be scratchy poison ivy we love you because you protect the forest most so a little eight-year-old singing that, and it was just, it completely reframed the context of poison ivy in the park as a protector. Uh, it was, it was such a, such a beautiful thing. So that, that story, I hadn't thought about that in years. It kind of popped into my, my mind there, Carolyn. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, 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 that's really lovely. Yeah. Cause you know, it's really about shifting your perspectives. Right. And, and because we have all been kind of conditioned, right. Mm. And uh, how do we kind of break free from that? And, you know, many people are doing it in many different ways, right? uh, but yeah, it's beautiful. And, you know, young children, they, they kind of get it, you know, a lot of them yeah. kind of get it, yeah. you know, so we can learn a lot from the young ones and uh, there's teachings in that too, you know, that the young ones are going to be rising, right? And that we are to be there to stand in solidarity with them. Mm. Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you so much for, for coming on, Carolyn, and spending some time on with us here this evening. Thank you, everybody else, for coming on. And um, and for all those yeah, that are supporting the whole series. Yeah, I just wanted to say for all the beautiful words that people are sharing in the chat box. And uh, yeah, hopefully our paths will connect and cross at another time. And yeah, just big thanks to Chris for inviting me out to, to share with you all. And, uh, you know, Sher Sherry Ann, is it Sherry Ann? Yep. Yeah, uh, for just kind of being the person behind the scenes that's uh, doing all the tech stuff. So yeah, just thank you to everyone for taking the time out of your evening to be here because there's so many other things you could have been doing tonight. And so I really appreciate you honoring that time. Awesome. Uh, yeah, good night, everybody. And um, yeah, I'll reach out to folks, you know, because um, you're all on the email newsletter and we'll probably get something going in the fall again with a, with another series there. So um, I'll probably send out a couple things this summer. It won't be weekly like I have been because I'm announcing the, the dates and everything. So uh, safe journeys, everybody. Thanks again for this great experience. Good night, Carolyn. We'll uh, be in touch. Okay, see you.